Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Tom Merritt, and uh, this is the first of what we hope are going to be not only a series of interviews, but eventually uh, a special to help people understand various topics around technology. And the one we're tackling first is peering. As you know, we've talked about this a lot on the show, tried to explain what's actually happening, not only regarding net neutrality, not only regarding Netflix and their accusations of being throttled versus accusations of just having congested ports, level three and cogent with their peering disputes, where that all fits in. Uh, so that's the topic we're tackling, and very happy that John Milburn agreed to join us today. Now, John, you have a long resume that I couldn't possibly summarize uh, adequately. Why don't you let folks know a little bit of your experience that is relevant to this? Because you have a lot. Uh, well, I've been uh, internet uh, user and manager since long before it was called the internet, uh, long before Al Gore invented it. Uh, started uh, on Unix and Internet systems in the late 70s uh, at, at Berkeley. Uh, 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 my, by training, I'm a nuclear engineer, uh, worked on particle accelerator, stuff like that. Been in uh, Korea for 23 years now. Uh, built out a lot of the broadband Internet infrastructure here in Korea. Um, and... Uh, uh, dealt with both the domestic rollout data centers, all the peering issues, and the interconnections uh, uh, within the region and globally. So it's safe to say you, you have a fair understanding about how the Internet works. I built a lot of it, especially here in Korea, which is, you know, unlike the bandwidth ghetto, which is the U.S., uh, our, our Internet is actually pretty functional. And Jenny Josephson, our producer, is going to be uh, sitting alongside to uh, throw out some clarifying questions if, if we get too lost down the rabbit hole as well. Thank you, Jenny. Yes, I'm glad to be here as the designated normal. <laughs> DN is your position. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so John, let's, let's start off because uh, what we've tried to do on the regular Daily Tech News show is sort of give people the really broad overview that the Internet isn't just you and your ISP. Uh, there are things called autonomous systems. There are people that are transit providers. Uh, there are CDNs, content delivery networks. And then there's sort of this new weird category that is sort of malformed. Sometimes a Google acts as a CDN, sometimes it doesn't. And Netflix particularly is really odd. If you could, if you were to explain to somebody who knew, who was familiar with those terms a little bit, how the internet is laid out now versus what maybe they heard about in the 90s when it was backbone providers, right? How would you explain that? Wow, that's pretty broad. Uh, yeah, we're going to start broad and then we're going we're yeah. to narrow it. <laughs> the, the, uh, there's nothing new about Netflix. Uh, uh, in some sense, uh, you know, Netflix is a content provider. They don't have users. They, their, their traffic pretty much goes one way. It comes from, from their service, and they push traffic out. Uh, there have always been such players, you know, way, way back. Probably the earliest one was the first big search engine, uh, AltaVista. And, uh, you know, they had their traffic all going in one way. Uh, the one thing I think people don't understand in this talk about open Internet is there's no such thing. There never was. Everyone has always paid for their access in some way. Uh, uh, the, the large content providers, be it Google, eBay, Amazon, they pay to connect to someone else. The, the idea of there being these large backbone providers or, or transit providers uh, came up because it was a natural way for networks had to be built a mesh network in the US between all the major cities and so on even in the days when we had lots of small ISPs in the dial-up days you had a few large networks that had those fiber links between cities you know coast to coast and all of that the that in contrast to the to the guys that were very content specific you know, as I mentioned, the early ones and and eBay, or Wikipedia, AOL, uh, Facebook today. Facebook basically has two primary data centers: one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, and they serve the whole world from those. The 
all content providers have always had to buy their access from somebody. All users, end users, buy their access from somebody. Uh, and so all of these issues are basically about the relative economics of those costs of interconnection. So the big question that started me down this road, and this was years ago when, I, when AT&T CEO said, Google and YouTube want a free ride. I was like, I, I immediately went to what you just said, which is, well, wait a minute, everybody pays somehow. It's not like they're, they're, they're freely accessing the Internet and AT&T is mad that they're stealing bandwidth. So what has caused, in your opinion the telcos to start to push this line that well, we, we are getting too much traffic. Our, and the, You said they push out traffic, but another way of describing it, I think, uh, would be to say that their customers, the ISP's customers, are requesting too much traffic uh, to, be, to be accessed from these companies. Why is that, why is that happening? Uh, it, again, from a, from a historical perspective, this is uh, uh, ironic and hilarious to me. If you go back to the late 90s, early 2000, we had a situation where the telcos were the ones making all of the money. All the content providers were desperately in the dot-com bubble. Everyone was desperately searching for a business model, for a way to make revenue. Content providers frequently approached telcos and said, look, your users are requesting so much information from us, why don't you give us a share of that revenue for all of the content we're providing to your customers? And the telcos uniformly told the content providers to piss off. Uh, <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah as, as they would. They're like, you know, and this is, and this to clarify for people was at a time when there were a lot more telcos than there are now because we've seen so much consolidation over the past 10, 15 years. But Indeed. they're saying, hey, you know what? They're paying us for access. You want to provide something out there for them to access? Go ahead. Right. Fast forward 10 years later, and you've we've had a a, a shift in in the, the the revenue models. The a lot of content providers are, you know have figured out how to do this. Netflix is always the poster boy for this because their users pay to access it and they send a lot of traffic. Uh, it's just the nature of its content with video streams is that, that, that it's, it's fairly high bandwidth. The telcos are, you know, a bit, a bit disingenuous, a bit schizophrenic here where on the one hand, they're providing a service that the customers pay for that access and pay for traffic. But at the same time, every telco considers its own network as its own property. And that anybody who sends lots of traffic into that network is potentially degrading the quality of the total network. Uh, this whole term of over the top, uh, uh, the OTT, is is one of the dirty words for all telcos it, and 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 it and what it comes down to very simply is the telco is jealous of content providers who are able to deliver their product to the end customer and the end customer has a direct economic relationship with that content provider and the telco doesn't participate in any way and, and, that, and that seems to be based on their historical model as a telephone company if you think about it is in the in the way of 900 numbers and that sort of thing and the telephone company owning their wires that all makes sense right and and you know telephone companies are in a tough situation here they are they are accustomed and they still have lots of people with a business culture inside the company of we build this thing for a a very large capital expenditure and then whatever service runs on top of this, it's, an, it's a marginal incremental cost for us to provide, but we charge much more for it because that's where we get the revenue that lets us build more infrastructure later to, to, to pay for that infrastructure we already built and to uh, build more infrastructure in the future. So we must be highly profitable to, to serve the public good. I mean, telcos, which started out as government-owned companies in, many, in most places, uh, yeah, absolutely have this culture deeply ingrained into them. And, and you know, they, they resent any type of competition. And uh, uh, being unable to participate 
is particularly egregious to them. And cable so companies that, would be similar as well for, for different reasons, but they have carried the content to people and, and collected money because of that content. It's even worse for cable companies. You've got, uh, 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 yeah, say the most hated company in America, Comcast. Uh, uh, but their 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 primary business is delivering that video content, the TV signal to you. Now that they're heavily moving into data, players like Netflix, who also deliver video content, uh, uh, are offensive to them. They're directly attacking their core business model of delivering video. And so the, 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 the tensions, the stage is set for lots of tensions between these larger players, and it's become a bigger issue as there are more bigger players. It's become a bigger issue as uh, uh, people become cord cutters. Now, uh, I, under I understand how a company might say, okay, we've maximized the revenue that we can get from the customer itself, right? They're just not going to pay any more right now. Uh, and we, we, we don't want to sink that money into new investment until we can budget some more money coming in. And that's why they're going after the content providers and saying, well, Netflix, maybe if you paid us a little money, uh, that, you know, that would help. That, that, that all makes sense from their point of view, as you've uh, explained it. But it is unique at least I think unique to the United States that this is playing out this way. I know European telcos would like to be able to do this. I, I've heard that expressed in a couple of places, but in the United States, it seems like they are able to do it. Why is that? Uh, it, it's very simple issue in the U.S. Uh, the most uh, people and businesses in the U.S. you have uh, for, for your fixed line broadband internet access, you have at most two choices for, for the vast majority of the population. And yeah, this is basic economic uh, uh, theory is that when you have only two players, when you have a duopoly market, you have implicit collusion at work. That, that you have you have, in most cases, a, a telephone company and a cable company. Those are your choices. And uh, they will have some relative market share, and it's in both of their interests not to cut their cost, not to cut their prices, but to maintain uh, uh, margins and market prices. So for, for those companies in that situation then, their drive is to find a way. They have a captive market of users. Uh, no one else can enter that market uh, to, to compete against them. That as a user, there's no place you can go but to one of these two. And if they behave much the same way, uh, it's not a real choice. And so that gives that access provider leverage against those whose business model depends on sending content to those users. Now, in, in much of the rest of the world, uh, the situation is different. There, there are very few markets now that have monopoly or duopoly for uh, fixed line access. Uh, here in Korea, for instance, every home user has a minimum of four options. You have three fixed line telcos and the local cable company. Uh, in in uh, I love pointing this out because you know um, Americans are uh, tend to be so negative about everything in China, the boogeyman China. But in China now, you have a situation where there are a minimum of three and often four fixed line broadband providers, and and uh, yeah, they're all state owned in China, but they're truly really competing with each other, and you have a regulator that is uh, uh, you know pushing for and managing that competition. So the result of this is in Korea, in China, in Japan, our basic home service now is 100 megabits symmetric. We're rolling out gigabit service to the home, and it's typically $30 flat rate with no caps. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people say, well, of course Korea can do that. It's a smaller region. 
Uh, it's harder to do that in a vast expanse like the United States. You also have folks who say, well, in my, in my area, I have three or four providers. So addressing those two things, first of all, is, is it different in Korea because of the geographic situation, in your opinion? And second of all, if there are three or four operators in the U.S., why aren't we seeing these higher speeds that we're seeing in other places with multiple operators? Right. As to Korea, no, it's, it's, it's certainly true that we have the topology and demographics to, to the, that, that allowed us to drive those prices down very quickly. We have extremely high population density. Uh, the people tend to live in uh, clusters of high-rise condos. Uh, Seoul City itself uh, you know, we've got a little over 10 million people. The, the metro area is about 23 million people, which is half of the country's population. So we, we, we fundamentally have a hub-and-spoke network uh, with, with the traffic concentrated in Seoul. All of this drives to the most efficient, low-cost network. Further, we've got the, our environment here is that we are a unique language country, that the both the producers and consumers of Korean language content are fundamentally here nearby. And, and so that means that our internet traffic tends to be, uh, these days it's about 99% domestic. Less than 1% of the traffic here ever hits the international pipes. And, uh, uh, yeah, and that's a progression because when when uh, uh, when we started the commercial internet services in '96, we were at about 90 percent international, 10 percent domestic. And well, so, I have to say your your bits are crossing the Pacific Ocean quite nicely right now. It's uh, we're you know we're on a you know 200 some millisecond gap, and uh, you know, sure we've got. They said it's only about one percent of the traffic, but one percent for us still, uh, uh, you know, my ISP that I'm using right now, their connection to the U.S. is about twenty gigabps, and that's about one percent for them. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> so their the, the yeah, core yeah. backbone in Korea is tremendous. So so that brings me to that second question: Why? Okay, let's let's take Manhattan, which has a very high density of population, and in many cases, you have more than two internet providers to choose from. Why don't you see that kind of capacity in some place like Manhattan or Los Angeles or Chicago? Yeah, a lot of that is is driven by regulation. The the you know Manhattan, uh, the New York City, Manhattan particularly are just notoriously difficult to do any type of cabling work anywhere uh, due to regulatory issues, permit issues, uh, the, the, you know, dealing with the city planners, and then dealing with uh, the, the unions for any type of installation or construction work. And that wasn't the case in Seoul rolling out, do you think? Uh, there was very much, uh, uh, by the city and by the national government, there was you know, very much a can-do attitude of, yeah, we got to go and push this and do it. Now, part of part of that is yeah, just that uh, uh, the total infrastructure of getting it done quick and easy, uh, and, and this is much the same in China. Um, and you've got Japan that's in between those two. Uh, more regulation, things are slower, more burdensome there, but still it gets done. Uh, Another big part of this is is the type of networks that get built. Is is we have a I think because of the competition, because of how it was driven in many ways, we have an extremely simple network here. In many ways, you know, the entire network is just a great big, you know, LAN. And that's because of the centralized nature of the of the population. Uh, no, it's ab it's absolutely not because of that. It's a uh, it's a choice by the telcos based on the competition to reduce the capex per user by using the simplest, lowest cost access technology to get the best, let's say, 
price performance ratio out of what you install. So I mentioned our basic service here now is 100 megabit symmetric. That means, you know, the internet pipe coming into my house is a fast ethernet cable. Uh, that is about the cheapest thing you can possibly do in terms of high-speed networking right now. We don't, we, we don't have DSL modems. We stopped deploying ADSL here in 2003. We stopped because it was obsolete. I, this is 10 years ago, and this is what you're still deploying. It, it, you know, yeah, it's nice and cheap and all of that. Uh, uh, we went to VDSL then. And after VDSL, we went to pure fast Ethernet, uh, probably around 2005, six. So and if if that's more efficient, why the hell would any self-respecting AT&T or Verizon not do that? Why are they dragging their feet along with DSL, and 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 resisting rolling out fiber? So partly the the requirement for DSL in many cities because your population density is lower, uh, because the distance from the home to the central office is longer, uh, it means you know, ADSL is the thing you can use on existing copper wires. Um, and, and you'll often hear this, oh, your speed is lower because you're farther away from the CO. And, and that's all true. It's, a, it's the distance and it's also the quality of those wires, uh, mm -hmm. uh, how much uh, parasitic capacitance they have crossover, how well twisted uh, it is. There's lots of factors that go into that. Uh, uh, the, so they are definitely trying to avoid, you know, changing their topology, changing their, you know, pulling new cables in and so on. Uh, uh, yeah. The, there, there is cost associated with everything, of course, but, uh, you know, they, they're making the economically rational decision to yeah, uh, keep the speeds lower and continue using the old infrastructure as long as possible. And part uh, of that is just it costs more to build infrastructure. I think everybody understands that. But is part of it also dealing with the difficulty of regulation and permits, et cetera? That's part of it. It's, it's, it and that all goes into the total cost of build. Um, uh, but part of it is without a competitive pressure, there's no reason for them to do that. And And... You can see those effects very clearly. You have, you know, AT&T, Verizon, these guys, you know, suddenly can roll out much faster broadband services in cities where, you know, the Google has gone it's to roll out their broadband. how fast Austin, Texas got fiber from AT&T, yeah. In, indeed. And, and so, yeah, nothing should be a stronger indication than that, 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 that competition is the true pressure for, for, for change and upgrade. The uh, uh, another big part of this, uh, what, what is it? It's a simpler network. We've rolled out this pure kind of Ethernet distribution, like that. So the connection to my home, I mentioned, it's a fast Ethernet cable coming in. Well, that goes to uh, a hub in my building, where a bunch of people have fast Ethernet connections into that, and then there's a one gig fiber connection from that hub that goes to the telco's office. And from that it goes into another Ethernet switch which aggregates into 10 gig connections and then into the router and the backbone. Now uh, how did competing telcos agree to roll it out so nicely? Well, the, the, each telco has its own network. They're not, they're not using the same infrastructure. There's overlapping infrastructure. It is not it is not uh, the efficient way to do things in, in terms of having a single infrastructure or, or what, what uh, you hear about a lot, uh, you know, cities that want to do their own fiber plants and so on. Uh, right. We really don't yeah. have that here. The, the often what happens is uh, uh, someone who does... You know, one company may own a fiber bundle to some location, and and they will lease it to the other telco. There's there's cross swaps on the fiber there, but that's uh, none of that is driven by government regulation or requirement. That's just pure you know, you know economics uh, 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 of companies uh, you know uh, 
coopetition. So that's interesting. In Korea, you don't have an unbundled local loop situation like you have in Europe. No. It's, it's, and, and each telco found it worthwhile still to roll out their own infrastructure. It sounds like the government was more cooperative in helping them to roll out, but the, the other side of it, I mean, what, what caused that competition to happen? Was, was it that you have that small geography? Uh, it, it's partly that. It was, it was driven by uh, you know, the fact that we did have sort of three players to start with in fixed line and then in mobile as well. Um, we actually had five uh, mobile players in uh, 97 and it's it's consolidated to three uh, the the fixed line was driven there were there were three fixed line telcos and yeah again when you have three real competitors and one and uh, you know a well-funded new entrant and and we, that uh, that third player entered the fixed line market in uh, '97 here, and it wa its largest shareholder was the electric power company, hmm. and which had a very large fiber plant because they had been installing, like all power companies everywhere, uh, for for the uh, since the early to mid '80s, every power cable that got installed also had fiber in it. That, that fiber is embedded in almost all power transmission cables right, or right. control circuit and can also be used for data transmission. So I'm trying to put this together because it sounds like, based on what you're saying, that one of the issues in the United States is the historical nature of regional monopolies. That exists for cable television, which is now rolling out data and has been for a long time. And that exists for the regional telco operators. Even when they broke up AT&T, they broke it up into essentially regional monopolies. And those regional monopolies have been consolidating. But Verizon and AT&T don't really run infrastructure over the top of each other in very many regions anyway. Do you think that that's one of the problems that we've had is that we, we never had multiple telcos covering the same area? Exactly. That is a significant part of the issue. The the that the, the, the local telcos have never had true competition. Uh, the, the the local cable companies have never had true competition. And when when that competition you know reared its head as a possibility, we did have it in long distance, right? We had the MCIs and Sprints Sprint, that, that yeah. came up in long distance. But never very strongly in the, the local area. When uh, when it came up with the, uh, especially in data with ISPs, where you had ISPs just running over the top of the phone lines, the the, the PSTN, uh, uh, that became a huge threat to the telcos. And so you you saw that as things moved to DSL broadband type connections, the the U.S. telcos saw what had happened elsewhere in the world and took very effective measures to basically block and kill off all potential competition in broadband by, you know, uh, by on the surface saying it was all unbundled and available to all comers, but the, the fact is getting, you know, their, whether it's their local... Uh, PUC, Public Utility Commission regulators, or national, they put lots of restrictions on what equipment could be used, what kind of testing and certification that equipment had to have, how the equipment had to be inside the telco's facility, that access had to be scheduled with the telco. They, 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 they created lots and lots of non-regulatory, uh, but regulator-supported blocks uh, that just killed off the economic viability of any type of broadband competitor. They did it very effectively, and uh, and so you went from a situation in you know 98-99 in the states you had a choice of 20 to uh, 50 ISPs wherever you were, and uh, to now having that choice between one or two. Uh, the, and, it, the, and, and to boot, the telcos got reclassified on data as an information system, so they didn't even have to bother putting in the non-regulatory blocks anymore. 
indeed. So uh, uh, that that uh, exclusion from any common carrier type uh, uh, regulations has been a godsend for them. Although I have noticed that they use the common carrier legislation when it's beneficial. For instance, Verizon, uh, there was a couple of stories recently about how they used their classification as a common carrier to be able to roll out infrastructure because that, that made it easier and it made it cheaper in some ways and they got easier permits, but then they were able to use those lines to have their information system rolling out over it because they were like, well, we're going to use this for telephone, so we want those old regulations to apply in the rollout, but then when we use it for data, we want the new regulation, the information system to apply. They play well, it both yeah, ways. Of course. Of course. Uh, that, 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 you know, I would do the same. Anyone would do the same. Right. So, <laughs> so, uh, so, so that sets up pretty good why we have the, the ISP sort of in control of things and why they're able to say, okay, we've got a captive market. You know, there may be a little bit of wiggle room between us and the cable company, but we kind of know where we sit as far as what market share we're going to have. So where do we get an increased margin? Where do we get new revenue? We have to go to the content providers. Now, explain if you can, and if you can't, that's fine. Uh, what is happening between transit providers like Cogent and Level 3? Because ISPs and these transit providers are having disputes. The transit providers accuse the ISPs of deliberately not upgrading their equipment, thereby causing congestion. The ISPs say the, uh, the cost of the equipment upgrades should be shared. And this all just sounds like gobbledygook to the average consumer. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's all true. You know, uh, you know, these guys are pretty careful to not directly lie about these things when they make these statements they're there's they're always true from some perspective uh, so it, in some way cogent cogent is probably one of the uh, outlier good examples of, of what's going on here so uh, cogent is a network which it, you know, is well known for cheap access, cheap cheap pipes, and they. If I'm a content provider and I can't afford to directly connect with everybody, go to Cogent. They'll give me a good deal and make sure my traffic is accessible. Is that what you're saying? Well, they'll give you a good deal. I mean, the 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 joke amongst the I'd say the the the, the core network engineers. You know, uh, for for from many years ago, we said, you know, there is that is that bandwidth or cogent bandwidth, <laughs> um, where it, it was it, it had always been, you know, sort of a derisively known as a lower quality bandwidth. Uh, a lot of a lot of cogent's ability to keep their costs down comes because they had legacy peering connections to some of the large networks. Uh, way back when, Cogent bought a company called PSINet, which was one of the very early backbone ISPs. And from PSINet, they inherited uh, the, 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 the peering agreements that PSINet had with folks like Sprint, AT&T, MCI, uh, which is now Verizon's backbone. Right. The old MCI net is, is Verizon's backbone. That goes so back to the UU net way, days, yeah. In, indeed. So, so PSI net, uh, uh, Cogent inherited those uh, uh, contracts and the, 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 the peering agreements with them, and that gave them essentially free connectivity to many of those networks. <coughs> now, all the details of these pairing agreements, you know, they're they're always done under non-disclosure agreements, and so you know the the finding the details of them out is is always quite difficult. Uh, but yeah, typically there is nothing binding in those agreements about uh, either schedule or requirement to maintain uncongested links. And you're talking about the interconnection between me as the 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 client of a cogent 
and and cogent where they with and so the ones in dispute now are between a, an ISP say like AT&T or Verizon they have places where they plug into cogent's uh, network right so it's it's the agreement between AT&T and cogent probably has no anti congestion clause it's it's uh, the typical thing in these agreements is that both sides will upgrade at upgrade at their convenience when the links are congested and uh, uh, and and so on and yeah there's a cost associated with with changing those links uh, typically they meet at multiple points and so some some link it might be congested in San Francisco but not congested in Dallas and then someone like Cogent might try and engineer their traffic that if it's going into AT&T's network even though the AT&T customer is in San Francisco they might reroute it to Dallas to put into AT&T so that's carried on their backbone. There are and lots that explains of explains to people why some they're like, well, wait a minute, why if if the problem is between Cogent and and Netflix traffic coming over Cogent, why does it work sometimes and it does in others? Part of it is the number of people watching at any given time, but part of it would be this kind of like network rerouting and and shaping. Right. That, that and that's you know we, we that's called traffic engineering in general. So so yeah the the you know the best. You know, operating engineers in these networks try and look for these problems and try and adjust the routing to the extent that they're able to in their own network. They try and adjust it so that their traffic goes, you know, uh, through uncongested paths. Um, I want to jump in with a question, and I may take us on a slightly different tack, so forgive me, but uh, one of the things that I'm hearing uh, when you're telling us about the way things were, say, in the late 90s, is that you had a lot of competition in a lot of markets, and now I'm hearing you tell me you have a duopoly in most markets. So I guess my question is, between 1999 and now, what happened to the climate? What, was there a change? Like, what, what would you say is a huge difference between then and now? Oh, the biggest thing was the growth of broadband. You had, you had all of that competition when most of the Internet access was dial-up because everybody could do a dial-up ISP, and the economics made sense because if you were the ISP, uh, uh, you were receiving phone calls from your users. Well, you didn't pay anything to receive the phone call, and in fact, if you if you you could make a deal with a what we called then CLEX, the competitive local exchange carrier, a competitor to the local phone company. Some of these CLEX had a business model of partnering with the ISP, so that when you, the user, made a phone call to to me, the ISP, it got delivered from your phone company to my competitive CLEC phone company and then the main phone company actually had to pay a per minute settlement fee to that CLEC for terminating for receiving the call of his user. <laughs> now the, 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 the telcos hated this of course because they had users who would be on hours and hours because it was all flat rate uh, phone service then the uh, the CLEX received money for just a simple interconnect to the incumbent telco. The ISPs basically got charged nothing for any of that connection. And and so, you know, the telcos reacted to that. And as broadband rolled out, they, they made it, they created structures and uh, uh, that made it economically impossible for the CLEC or the ISP to uh, survive in that environment. But is there an alternate history? I mean, I guess that's what I'm asking is, is there a way that that could have been avoided? Or uh, it seems to me what we're fundamentally saying in this is that that this is a bunch of big businesses that, that, that were like, nope, this is ours, and we're just going to hold on to it, and we're going to make it difficult for others to start, and... 
and now we're here in this mess where, if correct me if I'm wrong, but we are significantly behind the rest of the world in terms of the speed of our internet in most parts of this country. I mean, first, tell me, am I right about that? Oh, you're certainly right about that. I think the, you know, the the U.S. you know, just in terms of uh, average access speeds, I think the U.S. ranks something higher than 20th in the world now. It's in the 20s or 30s. Uh, and in terms of the cost per uh, unit of data, uh, it, it, it's amongst the highest. Uh, so, so it's behind in many ways. The right, the the alternate history. Um, uh, you know, there are many examples. So, one of the best ones is the UK, um, and they split up British Telecom, uh, and. But rather than split it regionally, what they did is they made BT the service company and BC, BT the infrastructure company. So that BT Wholesale uh, uh, was the new company uh, uh, that was, was split, which owned all of the physical infrastructure. But their mandate was to sell to all comers. So all of the other telcos, ISPs, can run on top of BT wholesale infrastructure. Uh, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier of the United States creating these regional monopolies, right? The the regional monopolies were, uh, you know, that goes back to the uh, I think what eighty two or eighty four split up of AT and T. Uh, but right, the opportunity, you know, was still there to to split out the infrastructure. The telcos have always considered. All of that infrastructure is their own property. And this is where the regulators missed a beat, I think, is that to, to not take into account that all that telco infrastructure was originally built under monopoly conditions uh, and, and where their profits were guaranteed by that, uh, uh, yeah, monopoly environment and so the public absolutely had an interest in how that infrastructure would be uh, handled going forward. In fact what happened is the uh, the regulators uh, just let it all loose, gave it all over to the to the uh, uh, shareholders of the telcos and did nothing imposed no requirements uh, uh, of any meaningful type uh, to create competition. Uh, the, you know, uh, the FCC and the public utility commissions across the U.S. have almost uniformly failed in serving you know, the, uh, the, the social interest of maximizing the benefit to society that they're supposed to do, and in fact they're almost all, you know, uh, uh, working for the benefit of industry, and and yeah, I say this is very easy to compare and contrast with a lot of other countries where you do have true competition, and it's largely because the regulators have behaved differently. So so now we have the story uh, where the government uh, favored a monopoly allowed an infrastructure to be built up in some ways. They, it was subsidized in part. Uh, if you go back to the Depression era, there's certainly lots of Works Progress Administration stuff contributed to that infrastructure. Some of it was funded directly by the company. They break it up, but they let them keep the infrastructure. However, they don't make it easier for anybody else to roll out infrastructure, certainly not at the local level. They have regional monopolies so that we don't have a situation like Korea where you can have three or four different telcos in a region competing and driving each other, uh, but you also don't have a situation like the UK where you have an unbundled local loop where the infrastructure provider has a different mandate than the service provider. So we end up with the limited choice, uh, and then we end up with what we were talking about with the cogents and the level threes and the transit providers. Uh, having had, it sounded like you were saying, sort of a spirit of, of good nature, a, a gentleman's agreement that it's in our best interest to keep this interconnection working. So we're not going to write it into the contract who's responsible, but over time, we'll, of course, we'll be wanting to 
upgrade our, our connection infrastructure. Is that how it worked until recently? Well, it's uh, 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 in the early days, it would absolutely was the gentleman's agreement, and it was, uh, uh, it was a lower-level agreement largely between, you know, the core network engineers. And, you know, if, if I wanted to upgrade my link, you know, it's sitting in Korea, if I wanted to upgrade my link to Telstra in Australia, you know, I didn't go through the business executives, blah, 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 you know, I picked up the phone and called Jeff Houston and said, Jeff, look at the link. Oh, yeah, it's a little full. Okay, let's upgrade it. Okay, I'll tell my business guy, you tell yours. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, a lot of the, the early Internet was done that way. And, I, I mean, that's how we made big pipes throughout Asia was, uh, yeah, the same way it was done between the ISPs and the states. It was a few core network engineers who just call up each other and do it. The, so when, they, when they came to writing these contracts... The thing was, nobody wanted to be bound because we, you know, we knew there's so much uncertainty. We don't know how this is all going to develop, but nobody wanted to be bound in such a peering contract to things that would create, you know, capital expense burden, where you, you, you don't want to be forced to upgrade. You don't want to be forced to buy equipment. So all of this is, you know, it's a... a You'll often write, you know, commercially reasonable effort is is one of the code words you use in there. Again, I don't know what's in these. Uh, At FCC, Chairman Wheeler seems to have picked up on that phrase recently, for sure. Uh, and and uh, you know that I thought it was funny when he when he used that because uh, you know I've seen that in so many of those contracts, <laughs> and. It's it's a it's a wishy washy word we put in these contracts so that we can do whatever the hell we want. That's what it seems like. It seems like that yeah. kind of phrase. And, and that, that, I mean, realistically, pragmatically, that's what it is. So it seems it seems reasonable. Then it doesn't seem reasonable, but it seems it seems to make sense to me that an ISP would suddenly catch on to the fact, hey, we're not required to upgrade this equipment. Uh, and in fact, we could have a little leverage here because we want to find this new market to make money. We've made as much money off the customers as we can. We're not feeling any competitive pressure there. Let's figure out how. And and that would be a very defensible and yet uh, effective way to kind of nudge content providers into striking a new deal by just saying, you know what? No, we're not going to approve any any equipment upgrades right now. Right, and more than that, you've got, uh, you know, let's go back to Netflix particularly. So you've got Netflix pushing all of this traffic out there. Netflix wants to pay as little as possible to send that traffic. They they go out and make deals, and, you know, and they, they, they go out and ask lots of backbone providers or CDNs and so on. They, they ask them all for, you know, what, how much, you know, will you give me or how much... Yeah. Will you bid for this level of traffic? The they want to pay as little as possible. So Cogent comes in with a lowball bid, and so Netflix says, "Great, Cogent, I'll yeah, I'll do this." And you know, and Cogent is planning on uh, say sending their traffic to you know Comcast end users, and they can do it cost effectively because they have this. Uh, low cost or no cost pipe into Comcast. Well at some point the traffic levels there become so large the the Comcast says, Whoa, you know, you know, the link's getting full, it's congested. You want to upgrade? Well, you know, we Comcast know that you cogent are being paid by Netflix to deliver this traffic. So share that with us. So you cogent pay us for this upgrade in this link. We want a piece of that. The you know, cogent, you know, desperately does not want to create a precedent of paying for connections that have traditionally been free for them, and so they balk, and you get a game of chicken. And and this this has often often from the beginning been the case in peering issues between ISPs. Is it's a game of relative power, of of. You know, and it it is a game of chicken. Who's going to blink first? Whose customers are going to complain more? Who needs that connection more? Uh, yeah, the the extreme example of that is 
uh, basically every ISP in Asia when we started up. To connect to the internet, we had to buy a circuit across the Pacific and then pay somebody to connect into their internet uh, port, you know, someplace on the West Coast. And so we were paying the full cost of getting there and the full cost of a port to talk to the internet through that transit provider. Nobody in the U.S. has ever paid anything to connect to the rest of the world because the rest of the world has to pay to connect to the U.S. All right, so before I, I, I'm circling us towards the what do we do about this question, but before right. we get there, I do want to talk a little bit about Netflix in particular because what I do think they're doing that's interesting is they've come up with a clever way of avoiding the cogents uh, of the world when they can get the ISPs to play ball. They can go to a cable vision and say, you know what, we'd like to interconnect some servers directly with you, and that will help your customers. They'll be happy uh, because they'll be getting these perks, and the perks have changed over time. For a while, it was a higher resolution. Now it's just a higher level on the chart of who's greatest at being a Netflix provider uh, on an ISP. But what's happened recently, as people probably know, is Comcast and Verizon uh, have both struck deals to say, yeah, we'll interconnect with you directly, but there needs to be a there needs to be a payment here. We're not going to just put your server in our system. We're going to interconnect somewhere else, and and we don't know what the settlement is, but the implication is that Netflix is paying the ISP for the connection. A lot of people look at that and say that's a net neutrality violation. Explain what that actually is and explain why Comcast and Verizon can get Netflix to pay, whereas Cablevision is essentially paying Netflix. Uh, yeah, so, so all of these are just levels on a scale. I mean, there's, 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 there's a continuum here. As we said earlier, everybody always pays for their access at some level. The... Uh, Netflix, you know, they don't want to do simple caching like a lot of the CDNs do. They want, you know, all the connection to come from their own servers. So, right, they make deals where with, with some ISPs where they come and put a set of servers in, in that ISP's core network. We don't know what, if anything, they're paying there. Uh, uh, we, you know... Uh, we know that for some small ISPs who've asked for that service, uh, Netflix is actually asking them right to pay Netflix mm -hmm. to put those servers in. This comes down to again, it's uh, it's relative power of of who needs it. In the case of a Comcast, uh, Netflix cannot afford, from a business point of view, to not deliver traffic to Comcast customers. They need to do that somehow. Is that because of the sheer numbers? Because Cablevision doesn't have much any more competition than Comcast does in most markets, but they're a much smaller footprint. And and uh, right, it, it's it's sheer numbers, number of customers, and, and and it's also the the you know the nature of the company. Comcast is known as one of the more aggressive players in this they area. Play hard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, they're 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 tough. Part of it is. Definitely, you know, Netflix is not, you know, uh, uh, without blame here. Netflix, you know, uh, you know, went to, and, and it's, it, you know, it's cogent recently, but they were at level three before that for their uh, Comcast traffic. They, they, they actually had to move from level three to cogent because uh, uh, this was probably... Oh, three years ago, uh, level three's interconnection to Comcast got swamped with Netflix traffic, and uh, and there was a big conflict, uh, you know, back then. Comcast sees this huge traffic coming in through a pier and says, "No, when the traffic's that big, that guy should come and negotiate directly with me." You know, you Netflix should make a deal with me, Comcast, and, you know, and, and we'll come up with a commercial solution. You, Netflix, are already paying somebody 
whether it's level three or cogent, to deliver that traffic. So don't pay that intermediary who's not paying me. Pay it to me directly. Seems perfectly now, reasonable. Right. And so, you know, you know, then it's like the old Oscar Wilde story. You know, we've, we've, we've established what you are, and now we're just negotiating price. Uh, the, the, and, and that's what this really all comes down to in, the, in, in this particular Netflix Comcast thing. It's just an issue of who gets what piece of the pie. And, and Comcast has a large enough customer base that, right, they can threaten to, you know, cut off or, or actually their threat is to just do nothing. Right. And, and Netflix service just suffers and people decide, ah, I'm not going to pay that $8 a month anymore. Indeed. It continuously degrades over time, you know, as, you know, because that traffic needs to go up. People want more HD. There are more subscribers, blah, blah, blah. The, the, so by doing nothing, by taking no action at all, they degrade Netflix, and they also degrade every other cogent customers uh, uh, that wants to deliver traffic into Comcast. The, they are also degraded. Which, uh, which, by the way, explains to people who are like, yeah, and when I use a VPN, my Netflix service is great because suddenly it may not be going through cogent for some Indeed. reason. Yeah. If, you, if, you're, if you're using the VPN, it might be going out through a totally different link yeah. Right, and not traversing that that uh, congested line. So this is where I have been, and I'm curious what you think. I think that the Netflix disputes, and and even the level three and cogent disputes, are perfectly natural. They're they're not unusual. They're certainly not examples of net neutrality gone wrong. Uh, they are the way business is done in peering, and it seems like that's what you've been saying. Is these aren't new kinds of arguments. No. The thing that's new in the United States is that the ISPs have more leverage and power than ISPs normally have had in the past and do have in lots of other parts of the world. Yes, exactly. The, the, because it's concentrated down to, you know, in, in most areas, a, a, a monopoly or duopoly of broadband access, the, the power of the big ones has gone up. And so you've got AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, who are the really big ones, um, and you know Time Warner uh, uh, as well, and these guys, yeah, you know, any content provider has to deliver to the users in those networks, and so they do have that you know uh, relative power in such negotiations. The that as an end user, yeah, you know, and this is part of the frustration you get in the U.S. as an end user, not having much choice there. It's very frustrating because you don't have an economic vote in this. You can't change your business to someone else to to punish a badly behaved telco. So, and, John, I know I know you don't have the power to do this, and you've been very kind in in, in helping us understand all of this. But uh, one of our listeners, Seb Gans, wants to know what is it going to take to get average access speeds to be competitive with the rest of the world. If, if you were put in charge of the FCC, do you, do you have an idea of what you would do? Uh, definitely the, the, yeah, the, if it was me with the FCC, the first thing I would do is uh, try to remove all of these local county, city, state laws that try to stop uh, municipalities from building and using their own infrastructure. I would like to encourage anyone with infrastructure to be able to use it quickly and effectively to create competition. Uh, the, the, it, it's, it's not just FCC, but it's the, it's the state PUCs also that need to aggressively encourage competition. The, and, and whether it's through you know, municipally owned fiber, whether it's through inviting in Google for making, you know, it's clear, Google, when they come into a city, they ask for certain regulatory changes, they ask for a streamlined permit uh, uh, and, and construction uh, well, process. Well, ATC screamed bloody murder about that in Austin, at the same time hustling to get their fiber rolled out. Right. 
So, 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 but, you know, uh, the, the, an aggressive stance by such regulators to drive competitors in this market, uh, this is the only hope to, to, to change this environment. It, only when the end users have that choice uh, uh, will the other market forces work themselves out, and you don't, you don't, you know. I'm, I'm, just, I despair that that anything about these, you know, open internet rules that 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 you know either side wants to put in or not put in, they always have such horrible unintended consequences. Uh, yeah, that that uh, they all end up stifling innovation and growth in some way. Yeah, just opening up municipal fiber allows anybody to come in and make really simple sort of Ethernet-based access. Now, you know, you need yeah, you need to get into a backbone someplace, but that's where you do have. The level three and cogent and sprint players that 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 sort of have those alternate backbones. Uh, uh, most content providers are accessible there. It's really uh, this will work if those barriers come down. But but the the trend has been in the other direction. Mm -hmm. and the regulatory trend has been to lock up and restrict municipal networks. It seems to me... Oh, go ahead, Jenny. Yeah, so I guess the question that comes off of that is we're essentially talking about um, what most politicians are always talking about, which is you have to give control back to the local level. I mean, essentially what you're saying is this cannot... The, the easiest way to fix this is, at the very, is in the last mile, it, it is in offering faster speeds... Uh, through the municipality, and if we try to regulate it from the top down, I mean, I can't even believe I'm saying this, but like, if you try to regulate it from the top down, maybe you're not going to get the best outcome. So, if you're if you're really talking about action, are you talking about the city council or the county or, you know, the concepts that maybe they hadn't thought they were in that business before? I think absolutely yes. That 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 the action can be taken at the city level, and we've seen that in a few cities. Uh, but as soon as a city tries to take that action, the, the telcos and lobbyists will go and try and get state laws in, imposed. So, so the, the attitude has to be there from the FCC, from the state public utilities commissions, but then the action definitely has to come in at the city and county level to allow for cost-effective and rapid build-out by new competitors. When that happens, the investment funds will be there. Right now, the investors won't touch things like that uh, 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 because all the cards are stacked against you. So it, it sounds like if, I were the, if, if the FCC were to just forget about open Internet rules, uh, and focus on encouraging that kind of competition. And there's probably going to be different solutions for different marketplaces, for different localities. But saying localities that want to go like Chattanooga, Tennessee and roll out their own fiber, we, we will put in rules that make it easier for you to do that. Uh, encouraging places that might be able to handle three or four telcos. We're going to change regulations to make it easier so that the incumbents can't block you. Is, is that too complicated? Is that too idealistic? No, that, 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 that all makes sense. Yeah, if you wanted to take this to the most, you know, how could you really affect this very rapidly? Yeah, as again, I go back to the uh, UK model. You know, if, if you had a really interventionist uh, uh, regulator and, and uh, uh, who wanted to, to really change and create competition, you know, that way is pretty clear. You go in and break up the incumbent telco. You just break out the, the their infrastructure as a separate business. 
but that's not going to happen. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I'm pragmatic no, I, enough to know that won't happen. John, I think I figured it out. You let Time Warner and Comcast merge. You let them buy Cablevision. In fact, you encourage Quest, AT&T, and Verizon to merge. But then at the very last second, when they've almost created a monopoly again, you break them up into infrastructure and service. That would be perfect. <laughs> that would create exactly the environment you need. You just lure them down the primrose path. They, they, they think they're getting everything they want. They uh, John, this has been fantastic. Thank you for taking the time to walk through all this with us. Thanks for uh, uh, being so gracious and letting my nerves settle. It's, uh, as I said, it's the first time I've done anything like this. So uh, uh, I, I had a few butterflies here. Ah, well, you did. You did a great job, Jenny. Any any other questions we want to? Discuss. Well, I think, uh, uh, and maybe John, you can just ask, you can answer this quickly because it really is a question I think for Tom, which is, all right, I feel like now as your DN, your designated normal, I have a better understanding of what could be called the politics and the economics of the hardware. Okay, so so we have a hardware question and we have a mm -hmm. hardware problem. If that's what I'm understanding, which is that somewhere along the way we fell a little bit behind for the reasons that we've already discussed. So what is the bridge between this hardware issue that we have been talking about and this economic and business issue that we've been talking about and this concept that I keep hearing day in and day out called net neutrality? Now, Tom, this may be a question for you to answer, which is where are we going next with this series? Because I now understand the hardware, but I couldn't possibly tell you how it connects to what everybody's squawking about. So you say when you're saying hardware, you're talking about the infrastructure. The and, infrastructure. Yeah, uh, John, what do you think? Is is there a bridge between net neutrality and and this infrastructure issue? The the it seems to me that the fear that's driving a lot of the discussion about net neutrality is that the ISPs who own the infrastructure will get so much power that they can start now blocking and restricting the things that you can uh, uh, access. And this is a well-founded fear. When, when you have AT&T for years now, now talking about OTT, over-the-top services, this is exactly where their mind is, that, oh, over the top is something we haven't permitted and we're not participating in, so we want to be able to block it or slow it down or degrade its quality. And so a lot of the, 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 the fears driving the net neutrality discussion are the fear of those large companies being able to throttle or block certain content. And uh, that is well-founded. The... Uh, We've seen, you know, Comcast do it years ago by putting uh, 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 basically packet filters, rate limiters in their network to try and uh, suppress P2P traffic and Skype traffic and so on. Yeah, BitTorrent Skype, right? Yeah. The, uh, uh, the solution to that is not clear. You know, the obvious, clear, simple solution... Again, it's when you have competition, any ISP who behaves badly that way loses customers. They move. When you don't have competition, the only way to solve it is, is through some type of regulation, and, but this is where you have to be careful. The, the yeah. regulations that require you know, a telco to, for all kinds of access and reporting and, and so on. One danger here, a big danger, is that you create a barrier for competitors. That now if you're, if you're a new ISP and you want to come into this world and you have all of these regulations about open access and so on uh, and reporting and compliance, it can create a, both a labor and a technical and a, and a, and a reporting burden that actually drive your costs up so that as a competitor you're not viable again. This, the, the, I'm, I'm saying the regulator needs to be sensitive to this, to monitor it, but be very, very careful about putting in reporting and infrastructure rules because it could become its own deterrent to competition. And don't think that these telcos don't know that 
and that they're they're playing this. You know, any kind of rule, any kind of regulation, you know, those they have you know lots of lobbyists looking at this from lots of angles, and their overriding goal is to make sure that new competitors don't come. They got to where they are in part by making sure the regulations were constructed in just such a way that it made it difficult for competition to start against them. Yep, and, and the new round of regulations will follow the same pattern. So when you see them fighting the open internet order, they're actually not fighting the open internet order. They're fighting to make sure it's implemented in a way that they feel will best benefit them. That is uh, correct. Because they're not anti-regulation. They're anti-regulation that is bad for their business model. That is correct. Um, they love and, regulation. Yeah. <laughs> to me, the open internet order is like treating a tuberculosis patient with cough medicine. Uh, it doesn't address the underlying problem at all, and in fact, it could make it worse because if it suppresses the cough, then you may think he's cured, and the tuberculosis gets even even worse. It is it is a band aid, uh, and I and honestly, I didn't realize it as clearly until we had this conversation today. Why I was so interested in hearing part of this versus the net neutrality part, yeah. uh, and and it's because to me, Jenny, the bridge is that the infrastructure problem is the thing that could actually cure the tuberculosis. It's the thing that can save the patient. Whereas the open internet order, it might be able to do something, but it actually might have worse effects and we really, you know, we're not in control of what it will or will not do and it certainly doesn't solve the underlying issue. Okay, that makes a huge amount of sense to me. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Good. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, that was a great, great way to pull it together. That's a, a lovely analogy also. That's exactly correct, that, that, that if you don't deal with the fundamental issues, uh, all this other stuff is smoke and mirrors. Well, we're going to leave it there. Uh, John, is there anything you want to let folks know about uh, regarding yourself before we, we stop the broadcast here? Nope, I do everything I can to stay stealthy. All right. Built a Very particle good. accelerator. Well, we, we first, yeah. <laughs> uh, there, there's a particle accelerator right up here that I built in Korea. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Well, let's, uh, thank you for, for going a little bit off stealth for us uh, today. Yeah. I really appreciate it. All right. Daily Tick. DailyTechNewsShow.com uh, is the place to get the daily show that discusses these kinds of issues, and hopefully we're going to do more of these kinds of interviews uh, and eventually maybe take a, a special out of it that, that really attacks this issue and, and tries to sum it up. Thanks, everybody, for watching.